loud. Really sad. The second half of this, we're going to try to record. Brad, before we get back to this, one thing I know I have a hard time trying to talk about right now is how chemicals in our brain get put there. Like, you know, a child, you know, when you make a baby, you know, you get your DNA, you know, that is also contains another set of DNA. It combines the two and it stresses in its own way. But what I don't understand is how chemicals like dopamine, serotonin, etc., get processed just from that. Like that's what I don't get. So the information to to create, not to create the wrong word, the information necessary to build the enzyme. Um, is all in your, in your genetic code. So the genetic code doesn't necessarily have the chemical structure of dopamine, but what it does have is an instruction manual for building a machine that makes dopamine. And so, and most, most neurotransmitters, everything in your body, either your body can synthesize from the raw components or it repurposes things in your diet. That's why we have essential nutrients and things like vitamins. Um, so dopamine, dopamine and adrenaline and noradrenaline are all derivatives of phenylalanine. Phenylalanine is a, is a essential nutrient, is an amino acid. If you don't get it in your diet, then you don't have it. Um, and from phenylalanine, there are enzymes in your body that take phenylalanine, add a hydroxyl there, remove an amine group there, and all of a sudden you've got dopamine. Add an extra OH there, move the OH to the other spot, you've got adrenaline. So it's not so much that building it from scratch, it's taking the, the amino acids that are present in your diet and turning them into either the proteins that, are, that can then go through and do this process, or um, the proteins grabbing the amino acids and turning them into these other signal molecules. Um, yeah, there's a there's a whole weird, I say weird, but it's it's not that out there, but it's definitely non-mainstream um, field of uh, of products that you can buy legally online that they refer to as like nootropics or something like that. The whole idea behind them is that they're they're things that are supposed to make you like, more productive or smarter or um, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. And they're not, most of them, it's the snake oil. It's dressing up, um, science, it's dressing up, you know, marketing to make, make it seem like it's scientifically based. But they do sell some interesting things that are not FDA approved. Like you can actually buy phenylalanine as a supplement. And instead of having coffee that has caffeine that increases dopamine levels by causing your body to release extra dopamine, you actually just flood your body with the precursor to dopamine, which shifts equilibrium into making more dopamine and more adrenaline and keeping you awake in theory. So there's, you know, there's this whole field that's, and most of it is, like I said, it's not worth spending your money on and could be actually actively harmful to sell some things that are drugs that are not FDA approved that we don't really know what they do. They don't really get you high, um, but they're not necessarily something that you want to be you know, putting in your body without knowing what the long term effects might be. Yeah, an interesting example of that is Keenan. He actually sees it in their, uh, I think, their space program. Yeah, so there, there's, you can, you can buy mild stimulants, you can buy mild sedatives. Um, I don't remember which. There, and I think that, that that was one of the ones that the Russian Olympic team got in trouble for, not this most recent doping scandal, but in the 90s. They were basically dosing their athletes with a mild stimulant that was stronger than caffeine, but not quite as strong as amphetamines. Um, but that didn't show up on drug tests. Um, so it's like, there's that's, that's all in this whole field of like legal gray area 
Um, you can buy it online and get it shipped to your house, but that doesn't mean it's a good idea. Um, sort of, sort of stuff. Um, what's the other one? There's one. There's a narcolepsy drug, modafinil, modafinil, something like that. Um, is a fairly strong stimulant that people use. It doesn't get prescribed for people with ADHD. Um, mostly because it's not made by major pharmaceutical companies, but there have been studies that show some people with ADHD that don't respond well to amphetamines do well on modafinil, um, but it's not commonly prescribed, but you can buy it online. Um, again, is that a good idea? Maybe, maybe not. It's, it's proof for narcolepsy, not ADHD. It's a pretty relatively strong stimulant um, with all of the addiction potential that that implies, you know, I think halfway between caffeine and cocaine. Um, but that's, that's where amphetamine sits too, right? So if it was actually prescribed, it might be really helpful, but buying it online is not an actual prescription. Drugs are crazy. I know when I was a kid, doctors wanted to prescribe Ritalin, mm -hmm. which I had said. Now I get it because one time we had a catalog and I thought like Superman and I don't think anyone should feel that way because it's not, it's, you get yourself in trouble. It's, it's really, especially the, the use of um, medication for psychological conditions with kids is really a, a potential, potentially troubling. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely so, and then and they don't prescribe Ritalin anymore because of the addiction potential. Adderall, it's an amphetamine. It's the amphetamine. It is amphetamine, um, but it's not as addictive as Ritalin, which is methylphenidate. Um, which, but both of them, none of them are really good to be giving kids that are still developing. Um, it's better to give kids the support they need to learn how to to get through school with their themselves, and then. You know, once they hit 20 or so, like maybe start looking at if they're not able to function in society because their ADHD is so bad. Um, maybe that's time to start giving them stimulants for ADHD. But I don't know. That's my soapbox. That's not. Um, yeah, I had, I had a friend in high school who used to sell his his Ritalin because he didn't like taking it, and but people would pay him for it. So. His dad was a cop too. He was a fun guy. <laughs> all right. If we're looking at, I think we're all getting fairly good at drawing the products for all the mechanisms, right? With some some hiccups here and there. Um, should we go through drawing? You guys want to go through drawing all of these, or should we do more practice picking and which mechanism is more likely? Both? Both. Draw, all Draw all of them. Okay, let's do it. Let me zoom in here. All right, so hydroxide. Strong base, strong nucleophile. Um, as far as drawing all the products, again, If there's not really one right place, as long as you know you have four mechanisms to go through, it doesn't really matter where you start. SN2 is usually more, you're more simple, but then both of the first orders share the same intermediate. So you can really, oh, this is the one we picked where it kind of could go. We had to choose between them, that rearrangement, yeah. Um, so, Let's do the first order reaction, or sorry, second order reactions first, so we don't need to worry about rearrangement yet. So SN2, substitution, hydroxide acting as a nucleophile, bromine leaving, bromide leaving at the same time. No rearrangements, so our SN2 product. Looks like this.
and our E2 product. There's a hydrogen here we could grab, and there's two hydrogens here we could grab. So our concerted elimination products And you get the E and the Z, E and Z. Of the product that puts our pi bonds to the left of our leaving group. And there are two hydrogens that we can pull off, which means we have a choice of making both of them. If there's only one hydrogen in this direction, then there's only we can only make one of those two potential isomers. Right? Because we need to have it arranged so that the bromine and the hydrogen that are leaving are in the same plane, that they're carry planar. But with two hydrogens that can leave on that alpha carbon, we wind up with two possibilities here. And you just go with the one that the sterics would favor. So this out of these three, or out of these two, we would favor making this one. Now, out of putting a pi bond here or here, in terms of figuring out which is more likely. This one's more substituted, but this one has less sterics and resonance. Putting a pi bond adjacent to a benzene ring means that pi bond can resonate in with all these other pi bonds. If you put the pi bond this direction, now we've got an sp3 carbon in between our alkene and our benzene ring, which is not as favorable. Then now this cannot resonate with this. So this is actually the Zate set of product because it's the more substituted product. But this is actually more likely because we're making a more stable. There's more to alkene stability than just most substituted is the most stable. In fact, most, most resonance matters most when it comes to figuring out which of them is the most stable. So this would be out of these three alkenes, this would be our major product. And that is assuming that it goes E2, that E2 is the favored reaction. Um, I just want to be clear that the bottom one is E and then the top right is C. So this is neither E nor Z, because these two methyls are identical, right? Yes. Out of these two, this is E. Because they're on opposites, they're pointing in opposite directions. Again, straight E is Entgegen. Z is Zusammen. So the same. All right, so now let's tackle the trickier part because we have rearrangement that can happen. And we actually have two possible rearrangements that can happen. Because a secondary carbocation can go through a rearrangement to become a tertiary carbocation um, to be more stable, or it can move that charge so that it's adjacent to a benzene ring. And have resonance. And so we really have two competing rearrangements happening here. One of them, and this is one where it's not, you're probably not going to get a mixture of products. 
because the rearrangement is happening basically simultaneously to your leaving group leaving, it's going to go. I guess I shouldn't say that they're. You're not going to get them because I. You're going to get almost all of one re rearrangement because this pro process happens so quickly. It's going to go to the most stable rearranged carbocation, which again, resonance is a bigger deal than tertiary versus secondary. So, our first step, our first carbocation, would look like this. If we move the hydrogen from over here, we get a tertiary carbocation, but that's less likely significantly than moving a hydrogen from this carbon and giving yourself resonance. And so once that rearrangement happens, we get an intermediate That puts the positive charge on the benzoic carbon. And that's where we would wind up adding our hydroxide to the SN1. This starts our starting point for the rest of the first order reactions. So from here, we can have an elimination and we can have a substitution. So that substitution would look like would look like this. And that would be the racemic mixture, the mixture of R and S. Because we still we now have four different things attached to this carbon. But we got there from a planar intermediate. So that hydroxide can come in from on top or on bottom. And our elimination products actually look just like what we saw last time, right? Because now there's only one of these two of the two alpha carbons actually has hydrogen to be removed. And it's the one that puts it in our pi bond in a spot where it can resonate with the benzene ring again. So we get the same two products for elimination that we got from, um, that is two of the three products that we got from the E1, we will get, or from E2, we will get from E1 as well. Mm. Is that right? There was the carbon. No, that's right. No. What did I do here? Yeah. There, yeah. Okay. And the other possibility is the E version. And again, sterics is going to be the deciding factor between these two. Now, if we're looking to see which of these four mechanisms is most likely, so what is our major product out of all of the one, two, three, four, five, six, if you count R and S as two different products, we have six possible products here. The one that's going to be most likely, we want to look at this and say, hey, hydroxide, strong, strong base, strong nucleophile, which means second order which means as far as major product, none of this matters, right? This is all gonna be secondary, smaller products. And for the most part on the test, the bulk of the test is what's the major product. So if it's major, strong base, strong nucleophile, secondary leaving group with some big bulky groups around it, Probably going to favor elimination. 
So E1, or sorry, E2, second order elimination for its concerted reaction, which means we get all three of those possible products, the most likely being the one that puts the pi bond here and has your big bulky groups on opposite sides. Right. So I was thinking second order in general. Mm -hmm. um, I know you just said that E2 would probably be the major product, but on the exam, um, how would you feel about us saving like um, both SN2 or E2? So would you prefer us to narrow it down to SN2? If that makes sense. Uh, let me. So let, if we look at, and actually I believe that the, the way that the test phrases it is draw all significant products. So if there's two possible, but then, and then tell me which one's the major product. So in this case, if I say draw everything, that means I want first order and second order substitution and elimination, regardless of what's the most likely. If I say draw significant products, if you've got SN2 and E2 happening, I want you to draw me all of those and then just circle the major product. Um, and I believe, I'm pulling up the practice test. So we're looking at it while I'm, so I'm not giving you bad information. So part one is draw all possible substitution elimination. So I mean, all four mechanisms, just like we just did. And then it has you draw a couple of mechanisms where I show you the product and the conditions, and you have to show the steps to get from reactants to products. So in that case, I'm deciding the mechanism for you. I'm not telling you what mechanism it is. You have to fill in the blanks, but I'm saying, forget about everything else that it could be. What's the mechanism that gives me that? And then for part three and four, part three is gonna be five reactions where you pick a mechanism. All you have to do is say SN1, SN2, E1, E2, just like on the, on the quiz. And the following page, and you, you can explain your logic, so I can give partial credit here. And like I said, yeah, five of them. So they're worth, um, they're worth four points each. And if you just put E1 with no explanation and you're wrong, I can't give you partial credit for that, right? Because it's basically a multiple choice question. If you write E1 and you're wrong and you explain why you thought it was E1, if there's any sort of consistent logic in there that matches with what we've been going over, I can give you partial credit. And then the next part is the same five reactions where I want you to draw the product according to what you decided on the previous page. And, and so I'm not going to mark you down twice. If you get the wrong mechanism on the previous page, but you draw the right product for the mechanism you picked, I'll give you full credit on this one. And so you, you would get marked down once for getting the wrong mechanism, but for being able to follow that mechanism through to the correct product, I'll give you full credit. Right, so this is my way of being able to give more partial credit than I used to be able to do for these reaction pages. Because if you guess the wrong mechanism and also got the wrong product, I could, couldn't really give you much partial credit because it just looked like you were guessing. All right, so that's the, the structure, how we're gonna go about these. So it's similar to what was on the quiz, just you're gonna have to be quick to be able to get through this in two hours, but it's, um, it's doable. And actually last year or the year before when we were in person, um, most people finished significantly early. It was not like everybody was still cramming to the last minute to get it done. Um, so it's doable in terms of the amount of time pressure, but you're not going to want to be dilly dallying. And then there's your draw qualitatively what the NMR spectrum would look like. And then there's a multiple choice question um, where I give you IR and an NMR. Um, and you have to 
um, tell me which of these five options makes the most sense. And then again, I'll give you this table and list of the IR frequencies. And if needed, I will give you the NMR table as well. But for the most part, and I, so I guess for, for the recording and for the five of you that are here, um, I will put the NMR frequencies on there. You might not need them. Don't think just because it's in the supporting information, you have to use them, right? You might not need them. I want to put them there so you have that safety blanket and I don't misjudge what you remember and don't remember, but don't get bogged down in all the detail that's possible. If you can make the decision without using it, that's what I'm aiming for. All right, but I also don't want to drastically misjudge how much you guys can remember under a stressful time situation. So I'll give you everything, but don't let it bog you down. I guess I'll ask this question just because um, in the event that campus is closed on Thursday. Yes. So we don't get Brad. Woo! So if we do that, I think what, what I'm probably going to do is have two versions of the test ready, which would normally would be a huge pain in the butt. Um, but since I had to give this test virtually last year, I have an open book version that's similar to this, um, but it's a little bit more in depth, requires you to, um, because it's making the assumption that you're checking your notes in the textbook. So if we have to do it remotely, it'll still be timed, You'll still have that two that two hour window or extra if you're taking it if you have accommodations. Um, remind me when I, if I have to set that up and I'll I'll add the um, extra time. Um, but you'll be able to and it's still be the same basic structure, just a little bit more in depth in some of these as aspects. Maybe a couple of qualitative explain this questions. Um, and maybe I make the NMR and the IR one a little bit harder, not make it multiple choice or something like that um, so it's it's that is what i'm leaning to towards for this class for gen chem i'm not sure what we'll do but at the same time they uh their test has significantly more time pressure so i don't really have to worry too much about making it open book because if they stop to look stuff up they're not going to finish um, so but hopefully we don't have to do that. The other thing that I'm considering is basically turn it into a late start. Um, if you can't, if it's snowy and you can't make it here, I think the bulk of the storm is supposed to be over by Wednesday morning. So that gives us a good 24 hours of snow plows and um, everybody should be able to make it here on Thursday, assuming the timing of the storm doesn't change. If it does, um, you can also, if campus is open, but if you still can't make it here on time for eight o'clock, then what we'll do is um, I have to give my, my gen cameras their test at one o'clock on Thursday. So if you can't make it for the eight o'clock because um, of weather or heck, at this point, I don't mind just opening it up as long as you're not talking to anybody else in the class. Um, you, I'll let you pick if you want to take it at 8 a.m. or um, one o'clock. Might be a little bit crowded because you have to be in the room with all the gen cam students. Um, but that's that's an option as well. Just let me know ahead of time. If nobody wants to take it at 8 a.m., I don't want to be here at 8 a.m. either. Um, but so if you're going to use that option, let me know. And that is one of the ways we'll work around the snow if there's snow. If it's a full closure, then I'll let you know when we get there. All right. We are only have about three or four minutes left. But again, this is all the same stuff we've gone over before. Just a quick review. We have an alkyl halide in something that could be a base or a nucleophile. Generally, the easiest thing to decide is first order, second order. 
right? Because you've got those lists of strong base, strong nucleophile. If it's a strong nucleophile and a strong base, it's gonna favor um, concerted, so second order. If it's weak base, weak nucleophile, it's gonna favor first order. Leading group has to leave first. And then you can go through and decide substitution or elimination. So you've got a strong, strong acid, strong base on a tertiary, and your, and your uh, leaving group is on a tertiary carbon. You're not doing SN2, too much steric hindrance. SN2 reactions basically don't go if it's a tertiary leaving group. So in that case, you're going to have a um, E2. Right, so deciding between substitution versus elimination is when you're going to take into account sterics, um, when you're going to take into account, um, you know, whether you're getting the Hoffman product or this eight step product, et cetera. The first step is the big one, and that's going to be based on what's your nucleophile and what's your, your where is your leaving group. If you're trying to decide between S2 and it's more does your nucleophile have access to the active carbon your active part your nucleophile has to be able to get to that active carbon right so in general our leaving groups are going to take up a lot of space no matter what because they tend to have a lot of of lone pairs and be big molecule or big um, atoms. Um, so it's more about can your nucleophile get in. And if your nucleophile can't get to the active carbon, it can still get to a hydrogen at least because the hydrogens are already on the outside and it doesn't need to get to the active carbon. It can get to any of the alpha carbons around it. And so steric hindrance favors elimination for that reason. And really, I have polar and non-polar here, but it's really protic versus aprotic. Aprotic is going to favor second order. Protic favors first order. Because remember, protic solvents slow down your nucleophile. They basically stabilize your nucleophile to the point where it's not nearly as strong as it would normally be. So it can take a strong nucleophile and make it medium to weak which all of a sudden can change whether which of these is favored. Especially if it's a secondary leaving group that could be first order, could be second order, depending on conditions. That's one of those conditions. And in both cases, steric hindrance favors elimination and high temperature favors elimination. So last one. We've got an active carbon with a phenyl ring, a methyl, and an ethyl, and a chloride. Amide, NH2 with a negative charge, is a strong base and a strong nucleophile. And we're in a nonpolar solvent. C6H12 is hexane. No oxygens involved in it, so we don't need to worry about protic versus aprotic because there's not even any oxygens in there. It's totally non-polar solvent. So with that in mind, we're definitely not gonna go through first order because that carbocation intermediate is gonna be so unstable because there's no solvent around to stabilize it. There's solvent, but it can't do anything. So definitely second order. Strong base, strong nucleophile, also in favor of second order. Tertiary active carbon. And that means we're not going to see any substitution. So we would see elimination happening. The nitrogen, the amide is going to grab either hydrogen from over here or from the ethyl group. Most likely from the ethyl group because that's going to make the more substituted alkene. Right, so you might actually want to draw it out as skeletal structure with the two possibilities would be, and then we'll be done.
So that would be if you made the alkene towards the methyl group. Versus if you made the pi bond towards the ethyl group. And then this has an E and a Z, right? This is the E complement. You flip the methyl down here, you get extra steric interactions. So it's going to be less favorable. But you will get some of that product as well. So the answer, the question on the test where it says draw all significant products, it's not going first order. So we don't need to worry about anything like that. And it's not gonna go substitution because your nucleophile has too much steric hindrance. It's only gonna be E2. So I would want you to draw all three of these and then pick which one's the major product. So, not that's our Hoffman product, and we don't have a sterically hindered base, so it's not the Hoffman product. And out of these two, this one has less steric hindrance. So our major product would circle would expect to be that one. All right. Um, I don't know what everybody's week looks like next week or what the weather is going to look like, but Tuesday morning is probably going to be the worst day for trying to make it in here. Normally, I would say, yeah, we can still try and meet during, during our normal lecture section on Tuesday. Um, I don't think anybody wants to be here at 8 a.m. next week on Tuesday. Um, but we can't, I will still be here for. Um, my office hours, which are later in the day, and um, basically during your um, your lab time slot, if things have cleared up enough that you want to come in and ask some questions, do a little reviewing with me, um, then you might have to share me with Gen Chem students because they probably also will be in asking questions, but I will be available at that time. Or you can shoot a picture of your work, send me an email, hey, did I do this right? And and, uh, and you can and I'll walk you through it remotely. Read me. So um, yesterday, uh, the previous lecture, we kind of started a team of four of us talking to each other. We should get together uh, on a normal lab on Friday, uh, but like none of us is going to actually come in here. So. Uh, I can I can definitely set something up. Um, yeah, if you guys if you guys pick a time, I because I don't need to be, I might not be available to be present. But if you guys pick a time that works best for you, we can set up a Zoom meeting. You guys can talk to, talk through stuff with each other. Basically, you can. You can sit everybody on mute while you just work on the practice test and somebody can unmute and ask questions when you run into a problem is usually what it turns into um, based on my experience last year. Um, but that's that's not a bad idea. If, you, if you'd rather do that, it's better than email, but not as good as um, in person. Um, that's uh, that's reasonable as well. Just I, I will. Any of you have a Zoom account? Uh, if you want, I, if you, um, if whoever wants to be the host, I, I can make write an announcement on on Canvas and post your you know meeting room number. So then you don't need me to run it either. You can still send me an email with a link that says, "Hey, can you hop in here and we have some questions?" And if I have time, I'll jump in there as quickly as I can. Um, or I think by this point, enough of you have my cell phone number. You could probably text me if I don't respond. It's because I'm talking to Gen Chem students. Um, but I will definitely check in before I leave on Tuesday if you're in a, in a Zoom and double and figure out what's going to work. So yeah, so I'll write an announcement later 